and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. I'm your host, David Delk. As we enter our third year of bringing Populist Dialogues uh, and the Populist pers Perspective to you, today's program is a review some of, of some of the programs which we have recorded during the past year. We started here in Portland and expanded our viewership to include Washington County and Salem on, on a regular basis here in Oregon. We're also now seen in Spokane, Washington, Urbana, Illinois, and Chippewa, Oregon, Wisconsin each week as well. Recently, cities in California and Maine have picked up our program for broadcast in their areas. And during the past year, more than 25 public access stations across the nation have broadcast at least one, and in many cases, many of our programs. And we're grateful for that increased viewership. Uh, today, we have excerpts from last year's programs, which include such people as Lloyd Marbet, an anti-nuclear activist and advocate for campaign finance reform, Dan Meek, a public interest attorney here in Portland, advocate for campaign finance reform, Jules Boykoff, pub political science professor at Pacific University in Forest Grove, Oregon, Evan Preston with Osberg, Julia DeGraw with Food and Water Watch, David Cobb with Move to Mend, Hector Suna with Opal Environmental Justice, Ellen Brown with Public Banking Institute, Kate Lohr, Social Justice Minister at the First Unitarian Church, Jason Kafori with the Oregon Progressive Party, Sammy Alloy with the Oregon Working Families Party, Marty Hart Landsberg, political economist from Lewis and Clark College, Robin Hanel, economics professor, Scott Moore with Our Oregon, Lee Mercer with Oregon Main Street Alliance, Janice Thompson with Oregon Common Cause, Lori King with Portland Jobs with Justice, Ted Gleichman with the Oregon Sierra Club and a member of the steering committee of the Oregon Renewable Energy Policy, Jerry Paulette, Executive Director of Heart of America Northwest. Uh, Elizabeth Swagger with Oregon Fair Trade Campaign. And Arthur Stamolis, Director of the Oregon Fair Trade Campaign. Kate Lohr, Social Justice Minister at the First Unitarian Church. My f former in-laws were actually exhibiting symptoms that predictably arise when societies become extremely unequal. Nobody's happy, nobody thrives, everyone gets objectified, and everyone suffers. But before I expand on that, let me share four statistics to help establish just how unequal we've become. These are all from 2012. The top 1% have an average income of $200 million per year. The bottom 90% of us, however, earn an average of $31,000 per year. That's a 65,000 to 1 ratio, and it grow, it's growing larger every year. Half of the full-time jobs in this country now pay less than $34,000 a year, and half of those pay $22,000 or less, which is well below the poverty line for a family of four. Moreover, even with our current Social Security system, one in seven senior citizens now experiences hunger. That's a whopping 78% from the prior decade. And lastly, one in seven adults in this country and one in four children now requires food stamp assistance. And some say that we are indeed at war in this country, a class war. But this is a war that has no winners. It's hurting us all, including the 1%. Let me explain. In 2007, British epidemiologist Richard Wilkinson published some highly acclaimed research results in his book called The Spirit Level, Why Greater Equality Makes Societies Stronger. 
His findings shocked the academic community and spawned a whole new series of other books. What did these other author authors find so compelling? Well, it, it seems as though any time the income gap widens in a society between the most wealthy and the poorest, almost every modern social problem increases as well. This explains why the U.S., by most measures the richest nation on earth, has a per capita shorter lifespan, more depression and mental illness, more obesity, and more of its people in prison than any other developed nation. So, for the very first time, we now have scientific evidence to support what many of us have suspected all along. Economic and social inequality is simply detrimental to humanity. Relatively equal societies, on the other hand, are healthier on virtually every indicator in individual and social health and well-being. It's a fascinating discovery. But what do we make of it? Well, it all boils down to the ways in which societies relate to money, nature, and the common good. When a society justifies the pursuit of personal wealth over the well-being of nature or the common good, everything and every body becomes a commodity. Life gets stripped of its sacredness and people lose their sense of connection to others, including Mother Earth. And when this happens, our spirits wither and decline with all sorts of negative health effects. Jules Boykoff, pol political science professor at Pacific University. In we have the public chipping in loads and loads of money, and you have the private walking away with the profits at the end of the day. So it becomes basically another system that's rigged for the rich to shield themselves from risk and put all that risk or a, a great load of it on the backs of the public. So in well, that is the general trend with the Olympics, is that security forces see it as a once in a generation, if not once in a lifetime opportunity to get all of the toys and weapons that they wanted, uh, but could never get under normal times. So take the example of uh, Vancouver, Canada for the 2010 Winter Games, where they bought themselves a medium range acoustic device. Medium range acou acoustic devices are used in war zones like Iraq, to, and it basically looks like a little satellite dish. You can look on YouTube and you can see how it works. There's a nice video and you basically just put it on people and the waves hit them and it's ear piercing kind of sound that comes out of these things, acoustic devices. So they would have never been able to buy that for normal political or for normal policing. But in this sort of political moment of exception, they were able to get that. London, similarly, BBC reported that the authorities in, in London were able to get themselves a long-range acoustic device. A medium-range acoustic device wasn't enough for them, apparently, so they got a long-range acoustic device. And similarly, they would have never been able to get this in normal political times. So yes, the security forces do use the Olympics as this incredible opportunity to get things that they've always wanted. Scotland Yard got 10,000 more plastic bullets just to get ready for London. I mean, they're just like, hey, mm. store up, you know, take our storerooms and stock them up real good. This is sort of a rare opportunity to, to get what we want. Okay, right. so kind of was the same way the United States ha can conducts wars in order to both get rid of surplus military equipment and to test out new equipment. The Olympics are kind of uh, used the same way by domestic police forces? Well, I mean, the, the fact that they do use sort of more experimental weapons is scary. And I think if you framed it like that to the general public, the general public would be quite alarmed uh, by that mm -hmm. way of thinking about it. And yeah, I mean, it's like big experiments that they're supposedly carrying out in the name of security that can affect everyday citizens. I mean, one interesting thing, I think, an important thing about what happened with the medium range acoustic device in Vancouver mm -hmm. was that there was an incredible groundswell of dissent that challenged the use of, and even just having a medium range acoustic device. So you had civil libertarians coming from the British Columbia Civil Liberties Association teaming up with black, black bloc anarchists who came together that said, you know, we don't want this thing on the streets either. We're going to protest as well. And so you had 
groups of people coming from all different areas of the city to protest this. And guess what? They were actually successful in getting the Vancouver authorities to promise to keep the thing in the box, basically. They disabled the weapons function on the medium range acoustic device, essentially making it into sort of a glorified bullhorn that they mm. could use to, for clou crowd control. So, I mean, while we have all these pressures we've been talking about all show and how it gives particular advantages to those who already have power, there have been really important moments in the history of the Olympics where there's been grassroots fight back from people and have been actually quite successful in defending some of the principles that they hold. Okay. Right. This is Elizabeth Swagger. She is the assistant director of the Oregon Fair Trade Campaign. With NAFTA, um, it's the North American Free Trade Agreement. Um, it was passed in 1994. And it's really served as a, a model for all other trade deals since then. Um, the way that it was promoted is that this is going to be a tool to increase uh, U.S. exports. Um, it's going to increase jobs. Um, it's uh, going to ensure that uh, our environmental policies uh, are upheld. And really what we saw was everything was the opposite. Um, so after NAFTA passed in 1994, um, since then we've seen 2.5 million trade-related job losses. And that's so the likely number is uh, something closer to 3.5 million. We've also seen um, in WTO rulings a rolling back of uh, the Endangered Species Act, the Clean Air Act. Um, it, it really is an opportunity for corporations to go in and just um, you know, take away all of the things that we've fought really hard for. Um, we have Lisa Frack. Who, uh, Lisa is a communications director with Family Forward Oregon. We in Portland have um, a, a situation where lots of the folks who work don't earn paid sick time while they're working. So the numbers are, are, are around 41 percent of private sector workers who don't earn a single paid sick day when they're sick. So the, the overall solution, I think, would, would be federal for everyone. This is a problem everywhere in our country. So that would be ideal. But that doesn't happen without lower levels of government doing it first. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's the state and sometimes it's not. I'd say in our case, Portland is the largest city in Oregon by a long shot and they know about this problem and they have the ability to solve it much more quickly than mm -hmm. the state does. Um, and I'd say the Portland economy is unique in Oregon and being its largest city, a lot of the places in Oregon are rural. Maybe a policy that in those places could look different. Um, but I think that the city the city council here shouldn't wait and pass the buck on a clear community problem to the state legislature in hopes that they might someday solve it. Mm -hmm. That doesn't yeah. feel responsible. Sammy Alloy. Sammy is a organizer with the Oregon Working Families Party. It's <laughs> a concept called Pay It Forward and uh, it is in part uh, similar to the system that they use in Australia and New Zealand where students at local, at um, public community colleges, universities, and um, trade programs would have access to higher education with no upfront tuition. They would uh, go to school uh, without having to, to pay any tuition upfront, and in exchange, they would sign a binding agreement that they would pay back into a fund, be it with the state of Oregon or with their institution, that'll depend on how the bill gets written. Uh, but they would pay into a fund a, a small percentage of their income for a set number of years. So a community college grad would pay about 1.5% of their adjusted gross income. A four-year grad would pay about 3% for 20 years, and that would be paid uh, conceivably as a payroll deduction, similarly to how we pay our Social Security um, and Medicare taxes, so that they have a dependable amount that they're paying each month, and it's not a debt. Uh, it accrues no interest, there's no fees, there's no default. You know, with student loans, you can never declare bankruptcy, you can never be free of those loans. This is going to give pa people a path to have access to their education, and then as their income hopefully grows, 
uh, the more years they're out of school. Hopefully, you know, 20 years after you've graduated, you're making a lot more than you did when you had just graduated. And so that fund will grow, and the set percentage that people will be paying in, um, you know, will be a percentage of a higher income and uh, will create a stable funding stream. Uh, Hector uh, Suna, who is the uh, community organizers with OPAL, uh, OPAL Environmental Justice. OPAL stands for Organizing People, Activating Leaders. A lot of people when, uh, you know, I mention, or when OPAL staff mentions environmental justice, they tend to think about the trees, the rivers, and the bunnies, yes. uh, which is uh, actually a little bit more than that. It's actually about improving the places where people live, work, play, and pray. And so uh, topics like transportation, housing, air toxics, uh, those are some of the things that are impacting individuals. And so we feel that that's you know, something important, especially in, you know, in the place where we live in Portland. There's a lot of things uh, in relation to transportation can be improved in relation to housing, affordable housing, and air toxics. Increases in fares, uh, service cuts, uh, Changes in lines, uh, yeah, downtown free rail zone is gone. Um, yeah, I, and also TriMet did want to put a round trip restrictions on the tickets, and I think through through the work that we were doing, we were able to kind of get that off the table. Dan Sears, who's the conservation director at uh, Columbia Riverkeeper. He is an expert on the impact of energy projects on water quality and community, including LNG, liquefied natural gas, coal export terminals, and power plants. Well, we're in a unique position here in the Northwest where we're being targeted for a massive amount of fossil fuel development. Um, currently, the state of Oregon burns about 3 million tons of coal at the Boardman power plant. Uh, that power plant is slated to shut down in 2020. The state of Oregon and Washington combined are now being targeted for export proposals of 150 million tons of coal per year when you add all, all of them up. Uh, that's a jaw-dropping number. It's huge. Um, and basically what it represents is, is our region tries to figure out how to wean ourselves off of fossil fuels. We are being viewed as a fossil fuel superhighway for uh, large, high-priced overseas markets. Um, so coal exports is one example of that. The other key example is LNG exports, um, where both in Oregon and Washington, there are major pipelines proposed to take natural gas, you know, fracked out of the Mountain West or Canada, ship down to Oregon, and to super cool that natural gas into liquefied natural gas, or LNG. Oregonians are very familiar with LNG because of years of fighting LNG import proposals. Now what's being proposed is LNG export on a huge scale, um, up to you know, between two and three billion cubic feet per day between the projects. Um, again, that's a sort of a jaw-dropping number. It's something that should get a lot of people's attention. Um, and so the, the issue of fossil fuels in the Northwest is really um, comes down to, at least at this time, whether we're going to become a major throughway for exporting dirty fossil fuels overseas. We had um, recently Senator Wyden from Oregon held a big uh, conference, or basically a panel, um, and he heard from hundreds of Oregonians who said, we're very concerned about the idea of opening up the door for fossil fuel exports, while at the same time creating free trade agreements that allow weak labor and environmental standards. So we ship the fossil fuels overseas, and we, you know, the finished projects come back to us, and our workers end up in a race to the bottom. Mm -hmm. This is Judy Barnes, who is co-founder of Oregonians for Renewable Energy Policy. Because of the greenhouse gases that are already up there, and that are going, we're going to increase temperatures that much. And if we don't do um, something more drastic as a planet, and of course our country and our state has a responsibility to, to play our part in that overall plan, that uh, we're, we're on a track to six degrees of warming, which is actually going to be catastrophic for us. So um, given that the answer to that huge problem is keeping fossil fuels in the ground, uh, how do we go about replacing that energy, that 55% of our energy uses, by, by the way, 
that translates to 2,500 megawatts of electrical power, okay, two and a half gigawatts of power. How do we replace that with renewable energy resources, which we can develop here in Oregon? Because we're blessed with sunlight, water, wind, and a lot of other natural resources here that we could develop, stimulate our own economy. What about bringing that $12 billion back into Oregon's economy? That's a huge economic stimulus. Could create jobs and develop resources here. So what would it take, and how soon could we do it? And that's where clean energy contracts come in. And you've had me uh, on, the th on the show before talking about this concept of paying average Oregonians who can produce clean energy to do so and compensating them by the kilowatt hours of energy from a clean source they feed into the grid, whether it's from a rooftop solar array or um, a, f a, f a farmer's uh, ground-mounted uh, uh, solar uh, array or wind turbines um, or a small microhydro thing in a, uh, you know, turbine in a, in a, sm in a small way, um, or biogas from animal manure, which would otherwise uh, leak uh, methane gas into the atmosphere, which is 23 times as potent a greenhouse gas. So how can we tap all those kind of resources and meet our own energy needs and bring that money at into our economy? Well, the, the policy, the way that other places are doing it, and this is proven, it's not just a theory, is to pay, as, as I said, open up the energy market so that average Oregonians can get paid for producing that energy. And there are cattle farmers out in eastern Oregon who could benefit having a secondary income source from not just selling their cattle, but selling renewable energy to the grid, okay? That's what we want to do. This is Marty Hartlandsberg. Uh, Marty is an economics professor and director of the political economy program at Lewis and Clark College here in Portland. His areas of teaching and research include political economy, economic development, international economics, and the political economy of East Asia. Okay, the increase in income from 2009 to 2010. This is the aggregate income of total all Total income Americans. of the United States. Okay. 93% of that went to the top 1%. Okay. And in fact, the top 1%, the top one-tenth of 1%, increased their income by $4.2 million over that year, the top 1% by 105000 and the bottom 99% on average increased by $80. Uh, from 1979 to 2007, the top 1% has captured 60% of all the increase in income and 90% of all the increase in capital gains. So when we think about interest income, dividends, um, non-corporate business profits, 90% of that goes just has gone, all of that, to just the top 1%. Mm -hmm. So I think the key is um, that since 1979, inequality has, has been growing slowly and, and substantially. Um, and what's important is not just that everybody's getting richer, but the people at the top are getting richer at a faster rate. It's that the top 1%, 5 maybe even 15% have gone better, but 60 75% of the people have actually lost ground. They, they command fewer resources now um, than they did before. Yeah. Income. And profits have grown at the expense of wages, but the bigger difference has been this explosion of inequality because of, particularly in finance and other places, some of these wealthy people are just generating a tremendous am amount of income. So I guess the point to say is that the Occupy movement was very, very important in saying, look, this is a, you know, this is a process that has a political drive, and, the, and as a consequence, it's not something that will reverse itself um, or that you know, markets will take care of it or individuals can respond. This is a political project. So these are the 30 jobs that are projected to have the greatest number of workers. So number one, it registered nurses, retail salespersons, home health aides, personal care aides, office clerks, combined food preparation and serving workers, customer service, heavy tractor trailer truck drivers, laborers and freight stock and material movers. If I go down that list of 30, 10 of those occupations, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, do not require a high school diploma. 14 require only a high school diploma. Mm -hmm. Only four require a college degree or more. So if the system isn't generating jobs mm -hmm. that require higher skills and, and pay, 
really doesn't matter what people do. We could have everybody going to get a college degree, yes. learning all these things, but the system isn't interested in hiring people because they've created jobs that, that don't have yeah. that. that. Um, one of the problems is that it's also tended to present to people a picture of the situation we're in as one that could be solved without really dealing with capitalism. Mm -hmm. That we can correct it. You know, if we tax more, if we punish the wrongdoers, if we channel money into social programs, then we can ameliorate these problems. And I think one of the ways you can immediately see that this is not so easy is to go back to these jobs that I listed. You know, if these yeah. are if these are low-paying mm -hmm. jobs, mm -hmm. um, people's ability to have a decent standard of living is gone. If 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 all the social services are you know, even if they're there, you know, what, what can we do? And, and so I think in that sense, the kind of focus on democracy, which is a very important one to take back our democracy, the fact is that our democratic structure is now doesn't allow us to vote on who owns mm -hmm. things. Uh, where we decide where they're produced, the environmental or human consequences of how they're produced, and, and who gets money, uh, what the wages are, and what the actual structure of work is. So that this notion of inequality is a very powerful one. But if we stand on the outside of it and just say we need to tax and channel the money into social programs, which, which is important, mm -hmm. in and of itself, it leaves the system sort of untouched. That concludes our program today. I want to thank all the folks that have helped us get our show on the air throughout this past year. And of course, we want to thank the staff here at Portland Community New Media, where we use their facilities and, the, and their expert advice. Uh, and we want to thank our crew, which has included during the past year, Dan, Janice, Janet Morris, Joan Horton, Tom Thomas, Dave King, Roger Bates, Lori Sutton, Beth Kerwin, Brad Leach, and Ethan Scarrow. And we want to, of course, thank you for watching, and we hope that we'll see you again next week. Bye.